and the picture Record. of what's supposed to come from the seeds. And what's interesting, as you look, I'm going to look at the text in a second. Um, look at the small seeds, how tiny they are, and what's supposed to come from them. Because when we read the text in a second, what does it say, the text, say about the mustard seed? Well, it becomes a tree. It's supposed to be, at least according to the text, the smallest of all the seeds, and from it comes a significant plant. I have a mustard seed, if anybody would like to share it. There you go. Yes, yes. Mustard. 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 This is my mother's place. My grandmother gave me when I was a little girl. Oh, there it is. Yeah, that's very tiny. Very tiny. Yeah. You might not be able to read the scripture, but on the back of it, it says, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, that's nothing will be impossible unto you. That's right. Oh, so that's if you pass it around. And, and look at the small seeds and what come from it. Uh, and so it's sort of interesting when you look at that. What's your impression when you see those tiny seeds? It's a lot of work. What's that? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Make them sprout. As you look at that, anything else, anybody else get an impression when you see those teeny weeny seeds? Well, if I saw them on my table, I think they were something to be thrown away. <laughs> there you go. Wow. Put it back into them. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, you had Okay. It, it's interesting when, you know, we don't, whether we stop to think about when you, when we get different kinds of herbs and that kind of thing, how the tiny start where they come from. I mean, it really is. Sort of interesting to think about that. They come from teeny weeny little things that we would almost discover. Yeah. And so fascinating that we think about that as we begin to get into these sayings that we're going to look at today and how Levine addresses this. And the other thing is. How do we value something? When you, when you look at something and you put a value on it, how do you do that? How do you value something? It's compare it to things. Hey, pardon? Comparison is one way to value something. Okay, comparison. <laughs> Anticipation. Okay. You know, when, the thing that came to mind when I thought about this <coughs> Anybody uh, ever watched the Antiques Roadshow? Yes. Yeah. I always find that a fascinating show. Um, people bring stuff that they found who knows where, and they put it before these experts, and they come up with, you look at, first of all, you look at it, and you go, that's a bunch of junk. <laughs> that stuff's just junk. And then all of a sudden, Something they paid very little for, or almost, they found trashy almost. These experts all of a sudden are putting incredible value to it. You go, what? What? And what we would overlook again and cast aside has this incredible value. And so you go, hmm, maybe we better be careful about how we assess and put value to things that we just overlook, just overlook. Um, and so it, it's one of these kind of things where, hmm. So I, I start out with looking at something that's small and almost insignificant. These are seeds that I guess just passed around for folks to look at, small seeds that were there. And from our handout, what I'd like to do is read through the different renderings of the parable of the mustard seed. And, and interesting, Levine suggests that the mustard seed saying is paired in Luke and Matthew with the saying of the leaven in the bread, in the dough. And in Mark, 
with the seed that was secretly grown or sown at night and grew, and the person who sowed it was surprised that it grew. So what I'd like to do is for us to read through those pairings. And her, her contention is that the gospel writers paired them together to provide context and the opportunity um, to be able to get meaning for them together, um, which is an interesting thing. And as I shared earlier, the thing I like about her is that she says, forget allegorizing. After. Forget trying to met make metaphors. After. She said, that stuff is really distorts what was going on in the first century. And she said, you get a whole different perspective when you try to get back in that first century and get the context of what's going on with Jesus and what's happening in that time. And as you read through the chapter, a little clue took me a while to figure this out. The last three pages of the chapter is the critical part. That's where you get what she is her take on. Now, the first part of the chapter is great. She shoots down all the stuff that has been interpreted, interpretations that she says are wrong, and then she gives you history. And then she says, all right, this is what it means, the last three pages. Um, so if you want to start with the last three pages of the chapter, that gives you her take. And then go back and start and read through. Um, but she really is, I find her to be incredibly refreshing. So let's get into the parable of mustard seed. Who would like to read? The, and, and these are three different translations that are coming from this. They suggested this that to provide uh, fresh translations. The first one is the New Living Translation from Luke. Someone want to read the uh, mustard seed and the parable of the leaven. Who would like to read it? Okay. And then Jesus said, what is the kingdom of God like? How can I illustrate it? It is like a tiny mustard seed <clears throat> that a man planted in a garden. It grows and becomes a tree, and the birds make nests in its branches. Luke 13, 18, and 19, NLT, NLT. He also asked, what else is the kingdom of God like? It is like the yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she put only a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. Okay. <laughs> There's the first pairing, and that was the New Living Translation. The next pairing... Again, yeah, same pairing from the New Revised Standard Version. Who would like to read from Matthew? Okay. Far away. He, Jesus, put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree. So Birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. And then the other parable. He, Jesus, told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was left. Very good. Thank you very much. And the last one comes from a translation by N.T. Wright, the uh, Kingdom New Testament. And that comes from uh, Mark. And then I want to have that um, added to with the seed that grows secretly. Who would like to read that one? I can read it. Go ahead. What shall we say God's kingdom is like, he said. What picture shall we give of it? It's like a grain of mustard seed. When it's sown on the ground, it is the smallest of all the seeds of the earth. But when it's sown, it springs up and becomes the biggest of all shrubs. It grows large branches so that the birds of the air make their nest within its shade. So would you read the Mark? Yes. Parable of the growing seed. Jesus also said, the kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows, but he does not understand how it happens. The earth produces the crops on its own. 
First a leaf blade pushes through, then the heads of wheat are formed, and finally the grain ripens. And as soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and harvests it with a sickle, for the harvest time has come. Great. Thank you all very much. Now, what three elements do all the parables have in common? This is obvious. I mean, don't look for anything hidden here. Just put, put seeds. It's all about seeds. Seeds. Love and seeds. Seed. Something small seed. that grows into something large. Yep. Time. What else? Time. Okay. What else? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. <laughs> you leave it alone. Yeah. You put it there and you leave it alone and it grows. Okay. Very good. Small and it ends up big. Again? <laughs> Small and it ends up big. Okay. The right. birds find refuge in food and sustenance and life. Okay. It's Very hidden good. and then seen. Again? It's hidden and then seen. Aha! Very nice. Okay. Yeah. What else? Someone planted it. Someone planted it. Aha! Someone planted it. Okay. Excellent. What's different? In both instances, they're beneficiaries, the birds, but people on the other, so it's it's widespread, I guess is how long. Okay. Uh, it's how the seed goes into the ground. It's sometimes it's scattered, sometimes it's dropped. Okay, very good. What else? I don't see anything that's different. Chuck, uh, two of them actually make a claim that it is the smallest of the seeds. Yep. You know, and uh, you know, and then it becomes the biggest of all the shrubs. I mean, those are claims they make, which you can prove or disprove. Yep. Levine is going to say that the mustard seed was not the smallest. Of well, seeds. yes. There were smaller seeds, um, although Jesus says they were. Well, yeah. Yeah. And so and yeah, the, yeah, question, yeah, and the question is, should that affect how we view the story? No. No. Okay. And some say shrub, some say tree. tree. Should that affect how we view the story? How do you account for the differences? <coughs> it's hard because they're not hard. I said Jesus was a carpenter, not a farmer. Right. <laughs> well, um, and uh, if you're around a storyteller, a good storyteller, what do storytellers do? They change the words for the audience. Aha! Excellent. They, they change the, the story and mold it to the audience. Now, the essence of the stories are the same. But they'll tweak it. They'll tweak it to mold it to the particular doesn't change it that necessarily, but there you have it. Now, it, it's interesting. How do you see the leaven and the mustard seed going together? Or do, does one help you understand the other? Well, they both have to be left alone. Yeah. Yeah. Once you put the leaven in, you know, you let it rise. And the seed you plant it in. Away. Okay. So maybe I'm speaking to both men and women in the day. Okay. The women probably weren't out planting seeds, but they were making the work. Well, great insight, Robert. Very good. Very good. <clears throat> and to your previous question, this isn't from Jesus' notes. This is from his followers, and they were from slightly different traditions in slightly different places. 
So the difference between bush and tree. That's from ox sticks. Okay. Excellent. And, and it's interesting because a lot of folks would say that leaven's bad and that they have mustard being noxious. And Levin says, no, 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 no. That, that really is, is a misreading of things completely. And she quotes, and I thought it was really interesting, she quotes the writer Pliny, which she does in several chapters. And I thought it was fascinating about how you understand <coughs> mustard. And I thought, whoa, she said, mustard was extremely, to quote her, beneficial to you. It's like the magic uh, elixir for anything that ails you. She said it was helpful in the treatment of snake and scorpion bites, toothaches, indigestion, asthma, epilepsy, constipation, dropsy, <laughs> lethargy, tetanus, and leprous sores and other illnesses. I went, holy smoly. I mean, if you're sick of something, get mustard. I mean, that, that takes care of everything. Good for what ails you. And I thought, wow. And so she was saying, any any interpretation that puts a negative spin on either leaven or mustard really is not accurate for how you understand what's going on in the time. And I thought, hmm, that's a whole new perspective when you're looking at what might be going on in that time. So you go, oh, oh. And so it, it really has a whole different way of the utilitarian aspect of both of them, of what happens for the bread and what happens for the seed and its use for the time. So that that really does shape because a lot of times people were saying, well, it's a critique of, of basically purity and, and it talks about empire building. And she goes, nah. <laughs> and she shoots that stuff down big time. She goes, any, any notion of that is wrong. And I thought, well, so much for those, those interpretations. Um, I'm not only going to go back and look at my sermons that I preached on that, because it probably included that. <laughs> That's down. So, you turn the page over, and it gives you her take on how she compares the two and the lessons that we learn from this. And as I said, the greatest line in the whole thing is when she says, sometimes a seed is just a seed. A bird is just a bird. And a tree is just a tree. And so we make much more out of it than we should. And on page 174, she tries to give a summary. And again, it's, it's very simple and straightforward. What's the comparison we have between seed and leaven? Someone want to read, and it comes directly from the chapter. Someone want to, want to read <coughs> the comparison of the seed and the leaven? I'm good. What they share is first size, yeast and seed are small, and the tree and the yield are large. Second, both play on the theme of secrecy. The yeast is hidden, and the seed grows out of sight, and the earth has the related parable of the seed that grows secretly, emphasizes. Third, the mustard seed and the yeast are both the necessities of life, bread and shelter. Finally, each shows that a single person's actions have a pos possible impact on life outside the immediate context. That is, the people who will come to eat enormous amounts of bread the woman has produced and the birds that will nest in the branches of the tree. We find this interpretation convincing? How does it give a different perspective on the context of Jesus' time and ours? I find it convincing. <clears throat> Someone else can do the second part of the question. 
Uh, anybody else have a reaction? Maybe um, as far as the differences, I would say that food and shelter were a little more scarce then than they are now for everything. Okay. And secondly, we didn't, not everybody makes their own bread or grows their own food today. Okay. Anybody else? Reaction? Well, yeah, so use of word secrecy. It's kind of interesting to me. So I think they had more need of secrecy then. Okay. It's, it's sort of a miracle if you bake bread, which I don't, but my wife does. If the yeast doesn't work, you know it really quick. You're really unhappy. But that's very true. Because that's a lot of work. How it does what it does, doesn't. You gotta have that starter stuff in there for it. No, well, that's the other thing. Go. That's it's small. Not a lot. Sourdough bread, you get it out of the air. Absolutely. I have one. My pledge is tiny like a seed. <laughs> yeah, but the results are dramatic like a giant tree. Well, well is I, a I think, message for you? <laughs> as, you, as you think about her surprise or the challenge, should we ever <coughs> underestimate, as you're implying, what our contribution or what we bring to the table? Okay, I, I got some. I got some. Right. <laughs> it is a little bit long, but. When my children, when my daughter and son-in-law got married, Don asked them what thing they wanted to use for their, for their, you know, what Bible verse or whatever, and they said the mustard seed, because they had, they were very into sustainable farming. They went and studied it. Um, their belief was that from something very small, um, they gave moringa seeds as a, as a, um, as a thing, but they believed that from something very small came something very big. And um, there, when we started looking for mustard seeds, y'all remember in the 60s when everybody wore mustard seed necklaces? They were impossible to find. <laughs> they were truly hidden. <laughs> but anyway, I just wanted to say that it is interesting that it seems to come around and become very popular or disappear and come back. And that's just, it, I do think from something very small comes. I just want to pass, tell you all that little story. <laughs> I'm well, sorry. <laughs> no, no, thank you very much for sharing that. And, and I think sometimes we don't appreciate the small contributions that can be significant that people make. We, we tend to discount and go, that's not going to make any difference. Well, it might make a difference, not only for the people who it may be a great sacrifice for them to make that small contribution, but what that small contribution may end up being. It, it's a significant, it could be a significant thing what that can grow into. Um, and so, we need to be very careful and appreciate everything that someone does in the community. Now, John Sermon, and he's been hammering on this for the last month and a half for stewardship, is that we all together are what? One body. And every one of us, if I heard him correctly, and I'm half deaf anyhow these days, is that every one of us has a place in the family and our place is significant and important what we bring to our place and that we should never ever overlook or discount the place that we have there you go does this parable help us to understand that terms of what we've been talking about. Does now with your help. <laughs> your help too. Well, well, yeah. the, the preacher's stuff. I mean you can you can you can mold it into 
But but think about that. I mean that 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 and oftentimes it's it's that 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 person that is very quiet, is always around, never says much, but is there making that continual quiet contribution that makes a difference in the long run. And and so I you know it's one of those things you go and I think that's that's one of the, the perspectives that may be the biggest message that comes out of this. And then the last page, 182. If you haven't read the chapter, <clears throat> read page 182. Um, and she really says that, and I've given you the quote, that is her last major, okay, if you haven't gotten it yet, she says, here's what you need to get as the last major lessons for the whole thing. If someone read that chapter from that, that paragraph from 182. The yeast has to be placed into the dough. The seed has to be planted. Even small actions or hidden actions have the potential to produce great things. From both the plant and the dough, you learn at least two, three more lessons. First, some things need to be left alone. Keep fiddling with the dough and it will not rise. Keep exposing the seed to air and it will not germinate. Not everything or even everyone needs our <coughs> constant attention. Second, sometimes we need to get out of the way. We are not always the focus. Sometimes we are the facilitator of something bigger than ourselves. The final image is not a focus on the human actor, but on the results of the action. Finally, both images are of domestic concerns. The seed parable is set in a garden or local field. The yeast parable is set at the village oven. The kingdom of heaven is found in what we do what we today might call our own backyard, in the generosity of nature and in the daily working of men and women. The challenge of the parable can be much homier. Don't ask when the kingdom comes or where it is. The when is in its own good time, as long as it takes the seed takes for the seed to sprout and the dough to rise. And where is that it's already present and coate in the world. The kingdom is present when humanity and nature work together. We do what we were put here to do, to go out on a limb to provide for others and ourselves as well. You know, um, she really, again, as I said, the last two or three pages of each chapter, she goes, this, this is really what it's all about. All the other junk's out of the way. When you get right down to it, this is what it's all about. And you look at it and you go, oh, that's pretty simple and straightforward. And, and you cut through all of the theological mumbo jumbo and, okay, I, I can get my hands on this. So, what might these parables suggest Christians, both as a church and individuals, do in order to measure the growth of the kingdom? This brings to mind the movie, uh, Walter Mitty, you know, he worked in the basement of the, of the place, Look Magazine, and then uh, he traveled all over the world to find the guy who was actually taking the pictures that are being viewed of the film. And at the end, you realize how important he is or he was, always was, very important. But that Let's us realize that our importance in life is is very real. That's all I have to say. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I just want to say two quick things. I have read these a lot through the years, but this really struck me this time. This yeast thing that it permeated every part of the dough. That just felt, and then it, it the whole idea of that it, it you're immersed with it. It permeates you. It's a very different feel than I've ever had before. And the other question I have is, do you think 
because we're talking about relevant audience or century, they understood what the kingdom of God was. Because I'd like to add, it's just taken me a long, long time to think I've sort of even get it myself. I guess being raised Baptist, I always thought the kingdom of God was up there. And all you had to do is sort of be as good as you could be and hurry up there. Because this was a mess. And 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 the the fact that God was trying to tell our generation, this is the kingdom of God. We are the kingdom of God. We made those things happen. And and that. But I just wondered, because remember they were looking for someone to change the mess they were in? I think that's one of the things, at least the things like uh, right, and I think with Levine, they're going to say that Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. So come into the world so that the here and now is transformed. And so the kingdom is here, but it's, it's not here as we know it today. It's here as it is redone, transformed <coughs> as God meant it to be in Genesis 1 and 2. That ain't where it is now, because it fell. So, Jesus inaugurated the kingdom as it will be when it's transformed at the end of time. And it's going to be here and now. It's going to be God's creation as it was intended to be. So like when we say that kingdom come, thy will be done. And I, and, and I think a lot of times people just think in their own personal life, like if God wants me to be rich, he'll just make me rich. Cool. Rather than, you know, thy will be done on the kingdom, you know, that, that we are trying to make this a better place. What's the next phrase? Well, on the, earth. That's right. It's as it is in heaven. That's right. Yeah, on earth. Yeah. Those, those are, I don't know. The kingdom thing is a really interesting thing for me. Well, and as you look at, at the book of Revelation, uh, a new heaven and a new earth, um, and the picture there where they sort of merge together with a whole literally new creation um, that will happen in God's time. And I think that that's what I think is, is what you talk about the kingdom of God and where if you have it from that perspective, it takes on a whole new meaning, rather than trying to put it off into a whole new realm, um, which we have done in the past, where all of a sudden, people like Wright and Levine say, nye, nye. have we understood that correctly? One of the best explanations I got was uh, in the back of a, a Bible we're using in our Venezuelan churches there. The definition was God's kingdom is wherever God is sovereign. That's one of the best definitions I've ever read. So on earth as it is in heaven, wherever God is sovereign, where people give their heart to God, seek to live out, God's will, God's commandments, that the kingdom is present. To, to me, that simple sentence just summarizes it all. His sovereignty equals the kingdom. Yeah, and we're, yeah that, that's very helpful uh, when you think about it. So, so the kingdom of God requires our participation, our action, and then God takes over, and the mystery happens. And we don't, we just trust that it will happen. We don't really quite understand how the yeast works. At least most of us don't. We just know that it works. Because <laughs> we don't really understand how well, that, that leads me uh, to an advertisement. <laughs> um, that um, in the new year, I've been hoodwinked into leading a uh, class on what is called Bad Religion by Ross Stout. And the opening I part. Volunteer. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, I volunteered. Yes. I volunteered. So we just were encouraging you. Said, was said, will you volunteer? <laughs> Pick your weapon. Okay. And uh, that's, that's <laughs> my weapon. Yeah. And in the first part of that, um, he really does a great job of saying, okay, what is, 
he lays out sort of the introduction of the core of what religious tradition has been in America. And he's talking about uh, traditional Christianity. And it talks about mystery and paradox that cannot be resolved or explained. And the problem when he talks about how we've become been made heretics, when we try to solve the mystery and resolve the paradox, we go off the rails. Um, and he does a great job with cultural history since World War II, describing where we have gone with all of that. He's really rather brilliant. He's a, a journalist with the New York Times. Um, and it, it's sort of interesting to think about that. And yes, Eric, you're absolutely correct, is that um, <laughs> we, are, we are to serve the kingdom. And will we ever fully understand it all? No. And we get ourselves in trouble when we try to make sense of it. Because can we? And should we worry about that? We need to remember who's sovereign? Judy. That's a Christian Jewish response. <laughs> Because you said that, it is 1045. Well, not quite. You can, you can <laughs> close you with prayer. <laughs> can, I, can I raise one thing? Because okay? yeah. one of the things that I, when I read this, it, it hit me for the first time in the last sentence where he says, the kingdom, she says, the kingdom is present when humanity and nature work together. And I find that so interesting because that is also hidden in these parables. And it is, of course, not what we're doing today. We are fighting nature at yes. every, you know, yes. trying to so try to be over it in every way we can. And I think that's an interesting Absolutely. lesson from these parables as well. Absolutely. Real quick, before the closing prayer, one of our members, John mentioned this morning, was in the hospital. Anybody know about Donna Clark? Yeah. What's it? She fell and broke her head. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah. She's doing well, though. She's doing well. Lord, thank you for this time when we can focus on this parable. And we just pray that you would use us as instruments like the uh, mustard seed, like the leaven, uh, to have a, an impact as your agents use us in our families, our churches and communities. Uh, we pray for those who are in the hospital. Uh, we just pray that your grace and healing would be present. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Thank you for sharing. That was wonderful. Yes. Thank you. I need help with all the parables. I can see John. John, I said you have a great day. It's a mystery. It always will be the same. I got it. 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 I